hi everyone and happy Tuesday. Um, thank you for joining us this morning um, and welcome obviously to the digital surgery webinar. This week we're going to be focusing on search engine insight and customer empathy. So to give you a quick introduction, the Digital Surgery is a new platform and knowledge hub set up for sharing unique insights from thought leaders and experts. Our mission is to teach and provide marketing professionals with practical knowledge and expertise in the morning so you can start implementing it in the afternoon. So my name is Louise and I'm an SEO account manager at Celeste. As you all know, today's webinar is going to be focusing on SEO, and we're joined by John Falgate, who's SEO manager at WEX, and Aaron Barefoot, who's an SEO consultant at Refinitiv. So throughout the webinar, if you've got any questions, um, then please pop them in the Q&A tab, which is just below, around about here, um, and we'll answer these at the end. If you just let us know whether you want to direct it to John or whether you want to direct it to Alan, maybe you want to direct it to both, then we can do that. But what we'll do is we'll have the presentations, which will last about 15 minutes each. Um, we're going to share the presentations with you as well, so don't worry um, you know, if you want to take notes or anything like that. These will be shared afterwards, um, including any kind of re relevant notes, sorry. So we'll do Q&A at the end. So to kick things off, I'm pleased to introduce you firstly to Aaron Barefoot from Refinitiv, who will be running through a quick demo with you to discuss the relevant tools to help you prepare you for Google's 2021 page experience update. So thanks, Aaron, and I'll hand the host over to you. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Just want to make sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, so I'll just be talking through. Let me just get this open. Uh, how SEOs can kind of prepare and, you know, get ready and updated for Google's upcoming page experience update. So they've been talking about this for a long time. I'm sure everyone's aware of it. But they're kind of looking to launch it around circa. Uh, May 2021 of this year. So what's included in that, kind of briefly, and more importantly, what actionable insights can we take away and what free tools can we use to kind of garner as much information and actions that developers and stakeholders and SEOs alike can take um, in order to kind of be best prepared for this update. So we all know that obviously speed is going to be more of a ranking factor and the core web like tools are probably the most um, lenient part of this update that we need to be looking at. So if anyone's aware or not, the main elements of the update, obviously, as I just mentioned, circle around the core web vitals. So essentially, it looks at the loading of the website or the LCP, which is the largest contentful pane. Um, basically, how big is that? And is there any room to improve that or reduce the size? The interactivity, uh, how quickly can a user actually interact with the website by kind of being blocked or preventing them from engaging with that and then the visual stability so that's you know when an action is carried out or when a button is clicked how does it shift and does it kind of essentially affect the user so these are a more of a myriad of elements across the website other than just speed so we're looking at interaction and everything across those lines so what i wanted to kind of look at and there's other elements as well like being mobile friendly safe browsing in other areas but the main focus for this bit is obviously these three kind of pillars that we want to look at so which methods can we use and how can we start to improve them so yeah which tools can we use so i want to keep this kind of more of a kind of working piece that people can just take away and use straight away and my favorite tools and these ones kind of cover a few areas so obviously if you're working as an seo uh, in my case i'm working in-house so you really need to get buy-in from the kind of stakeholders from the developers they want to put budget behind this we need to kind of give them a reason and we need to give them insight as to why we want to improve that you know let's say look our website's not performing as well as it could be that's affecting our ability to rank and it's affecting our conversion so really kind of giving them something to work with that they can see the tangible so obviously one of the main tools that i use is a really cool plugin called lighthouse so i'm sure many people have kind of heard of it or used it um, and Google's PageSpeed score now actually uses Lighthouse to kind of inform its metrics, but the PageSpeed score is a bit, I would say, kind of high level. And it doesn't give you the most actionable insights, kind of says just reduce JavaScript, but it doesn't really say much more than that. It just gives you like an idea of what you need to improve. Whereas the Lighthouse kind of report builds out and it gives you uh, elements of performance. So it gives you a score of 100. And then we can see that it actually mentions the actual metrics 
and the core web writers decided this. So we've got the first content called paint, which is red. So essentially it's called red good, medium or bad. Um, the large content called paint, the cumulative shift layout and the time to interactive, and then you can kind of get a breakdown of how that works. Just plug into free to use, and obviously you can just run a report on your site. Um, I might demo in a second, but I just want to kind of get across the main areas we're looking at. So this gives you all the information you kind of need to start making the case as to why you want to improve the website and why it'd be useful to focus on, obviously across the elements that are affecting the speed. So I'd say the main kind of takeaways for Lighthouse is obviously that you can share the, with the, the stakeholders to come by in, and you get a top line kind of insights as to which directions you need to take. So I think once you've got, oops, I didn't realize that animation there. <laughs> I think once you've got an idea of those elements that you want to start improving, to go to the next step down um, and to get kind of a more detailed report, it really shows us kind of like the types of files you need to work with. These kind of reports that we can share directly with the developers and say, this is exactly what we need to focus on. Another is free tool as well, which is really, really useful. It's probably my favorite speed tool is a web page test. So you can obviously just run your website in here. And now it's updated within the last couple of months to actually include the web vitals directly. And then it also looks at the scores along the top um, and then a, a meaningful number of other metrics that you can utilize. So I think the most useful element of this is that you can actually build out a waterfall, which I might kind of try and show live if I can. Just don't want to kind of, oops, the break on me. So bear with me a second. Well, can we, is he still seeing my screen at this point? Oh, no, I think you need to show your screen again. I can't. Right. I'm still getting used to Zoom again. <laughs> so essentially, once we could, yeah, it's done for you, so. so once we kind of run uh, within this, we can change the settings to be either a mobile or a desktop. So if we want to see obviously the difference between the two devices, so typically the lower score will be based on your mobile. And Google does kind of have a bit of a caveat where it treats it as if you're using a kind of 3G mobile device, which is kind of not the case in most examples. People have got like 4G or Wi-Fi. But it does kind of treat that as a baseline. So if you can obviously optimize it to work on a 3G mobile phone, then it should be able to work on any environment. So that's the kind of goal we want to get to. We want to get to it working on any level of device as a baseline. So obviously when you optimize, we want to optimize towards the least accessible and the least kind of user-friendly versions of any device, whether it's the mobile or the desktop. So I feel like it's going to take ages to load for me. <laughs> but, um, Let's see if it runs. I'll give it 10 seconds and then if not, I'll switch to something else and come back. Right, <laughs> it's not going to load for me, so. Let me just try and share again. Yeah, so come back to that. But essentially, yeah, we can look, I'll show you the waterfall in a minute exactly how to kind of go through that and how we can kind of utilize that to get a good idea of what we want to improve from the next steps. And then another really useful free tool is kind of built into Chrome. So Chrome obviously has the developer tool elements, which is really useful. There's a lot inside of that. Um, and one of the really useful updates that they have is their coverage report. So what this actually shows is how much of the kind of scripts that are running being utilized on the site. So we can get a really clear understanding of the amount of unused bytes in a given file. So say if we've got obviously our, our kind of CSS to be splining the page or our JavaScript to be kind of utilizing the interactivity of the elements of the page. We can then actually directly see like how much of that's unused. So we can go down to like a file level and speak with a developer and say, by example, hey, we can see that 56% you know, of these files aren't being used. How can we optimize that? What can we kind of tweak? what is the file kind of doing and what does it need to do versus what does it not need to be doing on a page by page, base, page by page basis. So if you've got kind of high value traffic page, for example, you can really utilize this to test that and say, can we kind of remove down use elements on the home page or say one of our top product pages and see how that affects the speed and then kind of see how that affects the conversion. So again, it's really kind of tangible and direct report that you can utilize. And I think developers obviously really come forward with you know, this environment and they can then kind of go away and look at them themselves and utilize that on their staging environments or their kind of learning environments to get a really solid idea of what 
can be improved or fixed. So again, with that, a lot of these kind of elements that inform the web vital metrics are usually, usually kind of like CSS files, JavaScript files, and these kind of elements that are you know, building up the load time or affecting the interactivity. And that, you know, getting that kind of really detailed nuanced report, I think is really, really useful for us to kind of share with people in the wider business. Um, I'll go back to web page test in a minute, but then another really useful tool that I use um, is how we kind of report on the improvements that we're utilizing or looking to improve. So if anyone's used Data Studio, which I think is my favorite kind of tool, so Google Data Studio, you can build dynamic reports. And inside of that, there's a connector for the Chrome user experience report. And then inside of that, you can actually kind of plug in directly to page load, interactivity, um, and stability, which are those three metrics that we mentioned earlier. And you can get a monthly score across all of your uh, pages. And this is obviously all interactive and dynamic, so you can share that. And again, just have a point of reference for people to utilize instead of just saying, we need to improve the speed. We can show these metrics um, and show how things have actually been impacted, if they are or not being, if they are or are not being impacted, and when we can utilize that improvement them a bit further. Um, how am I doing for time? So I just want to make sure I'm not running over. No, you're all good. Let me just try and see if this web page test is going to I'm going to share that. So yeah, we can see, I'll just use Mike.com as an example. But you can see like how much kind of detail report we get inside of this tool. So again, one of the most useful things that kind of separates this from just the page speed insights is that you can really just drill down to the exact files that are causing these issues. And then basically get a run across all the different elements, HTML, JSS, uh, JS, sorry, JS, uh, JS and CSS, and then start to see if there's any kind of outliers that are causing this issues. So we've got 404s, we've got 400 uh, errors. And then if you start to see something running like a really long time, then you start to call that out and say, can we fix this? Can we fix that? And also what you can do is kind of run a second report and start to compare the two. So if we say, let's improve this, um, this main CSS file, Try and get it down to like a, you know, a, few, a few less milliseconds, then we can improve it against a new run once we've carried out those fixes. And again, it's kind of really easy to see, it's visual, and it kind of attached to a larger number. Then we can actually start to say, what do we need to do to get this number down? Rather than just saying we need to just improve the website speed. Because I think typically we just share a report and say, we need to fix this <laughs> with developers, but we don't really say what exactly we need to fix and what we're aiming to achieve. So, really this gives us you know kind of a roadmap to play with and normally what i ask people to do in, our, in, our, in my company is whenever we make a change or a release or an update we have an excel sheet and we ask them to run the report on the same kind of metrics so we use like desktop in san francisco where it might be and then say kind of make a note of all these numbers make a note of the document complete time which essentially is like the main kind of meat of the uh, response in the website and a fully loaded time. And then we start to see how it uh, release and it impacts those metrics. And then we can start to call out the exact kind of element or style sheet or wherever it might be that's causing those issues. So it gives us a really kind of tangible set of metrics to use. Um, and it takes a bit further than, you know, we're, we're at 80 out of 100 for the website speed at the moment, because that's just the number that Google kind of gives you, but it doesn't then inform the strategy that you need to undertake. Um, I think across those three kind of tools, you can really get an idea of how to improve the website speed. And as I kind of mentioned at the top, this all plays in to the page experience update, which is essentially going to be now kind of termed as website tools, uh, for web vitals tools rather than just site speed. So I think once you start undertaking these tests, you can start to share that, build out a kind of roadmap, maybe, and then start to work with developers and stakeholders to get this underway and be ready for the update come May or whenever it might be, you know, with Google Slides, so it could be any time. <laughs> but let's assume it's May, and then we can have to be ready for that as it comes along. So that's the main things I want to go across today. And also I'll share the, the deck and we'll share the links so people can start to utilize these. And hopefully it's helpful for you guys and you can start working this afternoon with it. So I think I've caught past, so hopefully unless there's any questions, we're going to jump off.
Perfect. No, that sounds all great, Aaron. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. I think there's a lot for people to work on ready for the update in May. Um, if anyone's got any questions, we've had a couple submitted, um, then um, we'll obviously be run for it after John. But um, yeah, up next, we've obviously got John Falgate um, from WEX to discuss um, the ways in which we can use search engines to teach us how we can behave more like our customers. So thank you again, Aaron. Pass over to John. Thanks very much. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, all good. Cool. OK, uh, bear with me while I just share my screen. Is that all good? Awesome. OK, um, right. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I did a run through earlier and I, I'm a little bit quite a lot over 15 minutes, so I'm going to I'm going to skip through the. Uh, the introductions. Hi everybody, I'm John, yep. Um, okay, cool, so yeah, so the, the premise of today is to, is to transfer a new skill in 15 minutes. Um, I, so yeah, as I kind of alluded, I'm gonna fail in the, in the doing it within 15 minutes part. Um, but uh, what, I, uh, what I'm gonna to talk to you guys about today is, is how to use Google search results to understand more about what your customers are trying to do when they make a search. Um, I guess I should also say that I'm going to fail in transferring a new skill because it's it's not really it's not like a skill in that it's it's not complicated you don't you, know, you don't have to learn anything it's more of a process that we can we can put in place um, what we really try and do in SEO is what we spend a lot of our time trying to understand is what somebody's intent is when they make a search you know you can make a search for a specific thing or a service and there's a there's a, like a variety of different ways that you can articulate that, but the, in, but the intent behind it is, what, is what's important and that's what we're trying to understand. And that's what Google has become very, very, very good at doing. So, so we can leverage that by, by going and making those same searches um, and then understanding that the content that's being returned is, is the most suitable for that intent, regardless of you know, what we might have assumed it would have been. And there's, there's a lot of insight locked up in that. And it's and it's a very very simple thing to go and do and to make those searches and to start looking. Um, so I just want to kind of walk you through how how you might approach that and how you might the the kind of the the, the analytical process that you can take to to to, to extract that um, knowledge. Um, okay, cool. So this slide is I kind of just googled a whole bunch of facts about how we behave and how we shop online. It's not too important. Uh, I recognise that there's a lot of words and I've just talked over that. Um, but but really, there's uh, there's one main fact in here, which which I kind of want to premise what I'm going to talk on now, and that's this this fact here that's saying, essentially, what it's saying is that we don't really we don't really use the internet to to buy that much stuff. What we really use the internet for is to think about buying stuff and researching things. And in, and this fact here is saying that you know on average we we might spend 79 days doing that before making a major purchase. You know that's going to become a little you know that's going to shorten as, as maybe the the purchase becomes less considered less major maybe but when I first saw that I, I had you know I kind of I questioned that a little bit and then I thought about it for a little while and I and I came to the conclusion that that's you know that's probably quite accurate because what we're doing online we're not really we're not really just mindly buying things what we're what we're really doing is is following up on a thought that we once had about maybe buying something or um, you know, wanting to wanting to understand how it might affect our life or whether it's right for us. If you imagine yourself walking down the high street, desperately trying to find some inspiration for a present for somebody, you might go into five or six different shops and and browse, and you know it, it might it might take a while before you find that right thing. And and we don't use the internet, you know, any differently to that. Um, and it's especially price, right? We, we, we want to know how much something is, whether we can afford it now or in the future, or we, you know, we need to save, or whether it's, it's, you know, it, it's worth it at that price. So there's a whole bunch of questions we ask before we're, before we're ready to make a purchase. I think um, the other thing is that it's easy, it's really easy to forget that when you're a marketer, right? Um, in SEO, we, we, we see, we, we, we tend to view everything through this layer of data which is words and volumes and CPCs or, you know, and, and outside of SEO, we, we, we see 
website traffic and conversions and, and bounce rates. And we, and we, it's really easy to forget that there's people behind all of those numbers and those people have emotions and, and they have needs and problems and need solutions and, and desires. And, and it, if we, if we, we need to move past that, those views that we have of our website and, and our customers and, and go back to, or try to find empathy for these people by, by, by being in the places they are, looking at the searches that they're doing and, and seeing what's, what's working for them. And then, and then we can kind of, as I say, we can create this empathy and, and, and start seeing these people as humans. And that in, in turn can, you know, improve the, the quality of the conversations we can have with them. So I was thinking about, okay, what's a, what's a major purchase? Um, and I, I kind of settled on, okay, maybe a, maybe a TV is a, is a major purchase. It's, some, it's not something that we buy very often. Um, and I think they probably, you know, more, more often than not, they cost quite a lot of money. Um, so I almost randomly picked this particular TV um, and started Googling. And um, if, I don't know, if, when we present in real life, we kind of have the benefit of a big screen. So if you can't see the details on the slide, it's not, it's not important. I'll annotate anything that, that you need um, to understand in, in detail. Um, don't worry about trying to Google alongside or anything like that. Um, so yeah, if you Google this TV, uh, the first thing that you're going to see is that it's it's extremely bland. It's just it's just ten blue links to ten product pages. Um, other than that image carousel, we're really not seeing anything returned. We're not seeing like search features or uh, answer boxes. There's definitely no kind of articles or reviews or anything like that. Um, we're, what's happening is we're we're googling that um, that product and then and then. Google is, is returning 10 different places to go and buy it. And maybe that's not that insightful. Um, it is something that you buy and then Google is facilitating you buying that. Um, you know, it's confident of, it's confident of your, your search intent, which is, uh, you know, which has a commercial nature. Um, so, oh, right. So I'm gonna show you a few other examples of this, um, but before, um, but before I, I move on from this TV, I, I wanted to take uh, a step back um, and look at maybe a, 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 a different type of search that maybe this person has performed some, at some point in those last 79 days, um, which, is, which is more informational in nature. So the person has decided they need a new TV or they want a new TV. And now they're asking Google for questions. Um, they're asking Google to start suggesting TVs based on their needs. So, so this is what we would call an informational keyword which is essentially the person searching saying, here's what I'm looking for, what do you recommend? Um, and then as you would expect, we would see the search results change dramatically based on that. So now we'll see a mix of product pages. So the, the question is being asked, I want an anti-reflective smart TV and Google's going, okay, here, here's some products that, you, that based on what you're looking for might be interesting. It's also saying, here's some, you know, if you, if you wanted to look into in more detail, here's some reviews. Um, and then, of course, here's the here's the, the curated listicles of the best TVs out at the moment. Again, based on what your based on what your criteria is, and you know, that's kind of 101. That's not that's not that complicated to have already guessed. Um, that's pretty common sense. But what where the insight really comes in, and what, and where this this where the the insight into this particular customer really starts to Get extracted is if you look into detail into those search results, you're going to start to see stuff like this. So th this isn't this isn't a search result linking to a page that sells a TV or provides information on the TV. This is a search result which which send which provides a solution to that person's problem. And this is one of the reasons why Google is is so good as a search engine um, because it's able to move past the words that have been asked and it's able to extract. The, the problem that somebody's having and then and then start to recommend a solution to that problem which is that you you're getting glare on your tv so 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 that person now so if you imagine the conversation oh can you recommend an an anti-reflective or an anti-glare tv the answer might be well well this is a good tv but it also might be oh if you if you're getting glare on your TV, you, you might you don't necessarily need to buy a new TV. You can also just get a screen protector that's going to do a similar job. And now that that person now becomes humanized. You know you now understand that they're they're a person with a with a problem, and they're that it may it may even be that 
at this point, they're resentful of having to buy a TV. That they're, they're just trying to find a solution to a problem that they're having, which is that at five o'clock, when the when the sun sets and it comes through their living room window, they can't watch neighbors. Now, now we have now we have empathy for that person. Um, and the same at the bottom of that, at, at the bottom of this um, results page, you can see this curated um, uh, feature here, which is not suggesting specifically anti-reflective TVs. It's it's suggesting TVs which are good for a bright room. So again, now you place that person in a room in a certain situation with a specific problem, as opposed to as opposed to um, uh, seeing a, a a kind of semi-informational, semi-commercial keyword. And and that's and and now you're now you're going to have a, 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 a better quality conversation with that person because of it. So uh, let's try a different product. This is a Nikon camera. Um, it's it's quite an expensive camera. It's about two and a half thousand pounds. Um, it's one of the most popular cameras in the world. Um, and it's extremely, um, it has an extremely high search volume. So a lot of people are looking for this camera. Um, and maybe, you know, at first thought, okay, so this is a product search again, this is a commercial keyword, we're going to expect to see the same kind of stuff as we as we would with the TV. But the reality is that it's, it's almost the entire polar opposite of that. Now, we're only seeing articles, and we're only seeing Oh, sorry. We're only seeing so we're seeing articles like uh, reviews and and guides and these and these articles um, and these pages are like incredibly detailed and some of them are like three and four thousand words long and there's some of them are spread over nine or ten different pages of like really in depth reviews of every single aspect of the camera and we're seeing we're starting to see loads and loads and loads of rich results um, like people also ask and video carousels etc cetera, etc cetera. and actually. We're only seeing one commercial or, or one product page link in that in that whole search result. Um, if you don't include the if you don't include the the, the ads, there's there's literally only one commercial organic commercial um, result in that whole thing. So for for a product that you buy, the the content that's being returned isn't facilitating you buying it. It's it's, it's that and that, that that takes a little bit of a a second to appreciate right but but the reality is that um a, a tv isn't a camera you know we we buy these two different things with entirely different motivators um you know i'm, I'm not a, a marketing psychologist I'm, I'm just a an seo who looks at this stuff right but but is it that we buy a tv because we need a new tv for the most part um but actually, when we're buying a camera, that's that's related to something entirely different within us. You know, we're, that's something that we're passionate about, and it's and it's probably something that we spend months and months and months, seventy nine days, researching and thinking about and comparing with other ones and asking questions and 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 deliberating over the minute details. Right? This this is a this is a this is a purchase that is related to our passion and it's related to our, our art or you know the, the literally the quality of our life. And that's not something that we that's not a decision that we take very lightly. And even it might be that the case that if you if you're an avid um, photographer, you're not even interested in buying it. You're you're just interested in finding out about the various different cameras. At this point, Google is aware that the, the, the higher proportion of people who are making the search aren't buying it. They're trying to consume content on it um, and therefore the the. The most relevant and useful um, results to return for that search on um, product pages where you can buy it. It's it's those pages that have four and five thousand words and videos and and uh, and in depth reviews. Um, and again, so again, now now we have a human behind that search as opposed to a really high volume. What we you would have been forgiven for assuming would, was a commercial keyword. Now we have, you know, a, a, a grandparent who's taking their children on holiday and, and wants to preserve extremely important memories. Or we have you know, a, a, a young person who's, who's just getting into photography and is extremely passionate, um, but, 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 but now we have empathy, right? And again, that's going to greatly inform the kind of content that we create. 
if we could, if we manage to bring those people to our website. Um, I'm going to whiz through how am I doing? It says that it says um, 30 minutes of my timer. I think I started that earlier, didn't I? Yeah, that's fine though. Honestly, carry on. Okay, cool. Um, right. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to whiz through a few more. So marketing agency, that you know, that's a pretty um, the, the the intent in that um, keyword seems like seems to be relatively explicit, right? They, you wouldn't you'd be forgiven for thinking that there was kind of nuance in that. If you Google it, the, the first thing that is, is being returned is a is a is a is a um, a map feature, uh, only returning marketing agencies based on your explicit location or your, on your location, um, and then the. The, the blue links after that are all for agencies local to your area. Again, there's there, there's there's a, there's insight in that to understand that people arriving on your site from these keywords are in your local area. That can greatly inform the kind of conversations that you might have with them. And um, one that I haven't got a slide for, which is um, basically any insurance term. Uh, if you Google home insurance now, you don't see insurers return for these keywords. You see comparison engines which again, can have a massive bearing on your SEO strategy, but it also, you know, outside of SEO also allows us to start unpicking what people are expecting and what people want when they're shopping for insurance, which is not to speak to an insurer, which is to find somebody who can tell them what the cheapest insurance is without them having to do the research. And that, you know, that, that you, can, you can go as far down that rabbit hole as you want, but you, can, you could potentially arrive at a, um, an understanding of, of their level of apathy or, or lack of care for, for insurance maybe, or certainly that they're price driven. Um, rapid prototyping is a, is a really interesting one. Um, it only returns informational features. There's, no, there's not really um, commercial pages for, for, for that keyword. Uh, in fact, there's, there's, only one, um, there's only one result on that page, which is a company providing rapid prototyping. All the others are even interestingly, uh, the, 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 uh, the organic links there are all targeted to what is rapid prototyping, not to, not to the keyword rapid prototyping. And that basically tells us that when people search that keyword, they are effectively asking what it is, not where can I buy it? Again, if you, if you sold that service, it's not necessarily a bad, um, page to make or a, a bad piece of content to create you you just want to be careful that you're not mixing those people with the same people who are arriving expecting it to be a service you know you, it kind of tells you that you need to have two pages one which is about your service which is going to get a handful of like drip fed traffic throughout the year but, but those are the ones that you you want to talk to about your service and those are the ones you can expect to convert the flood of traffic from this high volume keyword you know they might not you might not see conversions of those and in fact they're probably just children doing their homework at this point, right? Uh, oh yeah, my final one. Um, so I wanted to find just something really mundane and commoditized. Um, so I picked hairbrush. The results, as you might expect, were kind of the same as the TV. It's just a bunch of um, category pages. There's SEO insight in there. They're, they're optimized and, and targeted slightly differently and, and we, can, we can gain some, some, uh, some good targeting insight into that. But beyond SEO, well, made me laugh the first time I saw it. But um, essentially, halfway up that page is a is a is a single informational page, which talks about the best hairbrushes of 2020. And I, I when I first saw that, I kind of questioned, oh, why would anybody read that article? Surely that's something that we would we just we buy when we need one, uh, we, we, you know, without that too much thought. Um, but then it kind of. When I thought about it for a second, it allowed me to place that person uh, waiting for the kettle to boil or waiting for a bus or you know during an ad break or something like this. And, and maybe just in the right moment, that might be interest, it might be of interest to some people. And it, you know, that can affect it, you know, you're not gonna it would be a, a silly thing to do to try and use that type of page to target that keyword, but it might not be a silly thing to do to present that content certain points as you're having these conversations with people or certainly at the very least it might be it might be of interest to know which is the best hairbrush maybe you don't need a whole page of content but but being told which is the best one is might be useful to somebody who's who's faced with a category page of 50 different hairbrushes um again it's just 
it just there's a there's an extra layer of empathy that you can gain or and some humanization that you can place as a layer on top of that keyword because of it okay cool right so just very quickly uh, before i shut up there's just some actions for us for this um the first action is don't do too much um this this is this works really nicely as a thought experiment um but if you're going to affect real you know meaningful change on your website because of it you you, you still need to do that with with a with the insight of of, of data and uh, and people who can who can do that carefully and and, and measured with as a, you know as an seo or or someone um in conversion or ux or something like this you know, someone who's someone who's um going to do this safely but after that go to town start start um wearing your customer shoes and and doing these searches uh and understanding or questioning what's appearing on the search results and how and why that might be useful to them um it's a weird thing to do or, or yeah it's a so move outside of that kind of insular world of your own website and, and go and do the things the customers are doing go and experience that customer journey of, across those 79 days if you you know it's a really weird thing to do to think about your customer journey starting from that moment when you drop that first cookie or you know the first time they enter your website because their journey started 79 days ago and and you can go and you can go and go through every single step of that with them all of the keywords are there for you to find uh, and look at and analyze and and then and then you can start to put together a picture of what happened to them and you know what was that first thing that happened in their life which meant that 79 days later they were considering the thing that you sell look at that whole story and then and then you can start to you can you can then start to build a real clear picture of what their drivers are what their emotions are and and who they are as people if you if you have all of that drawn out that's your that then become becomes your content strategy right um and then and then if you if you know what if you know what your content strategy then you can and you and you and you have this really clear understanding of who your people are then you can start to think outside of that box and traditionally we think of product pages that sell pro our products and our category pages which curate lists of our products and then our blog for everything else but but that we can move outside of those boxes when we understand that somebody's intent for a specific product might not be might be as informational as it is commercially minded or 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 that 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 category page of products is not it's not that interesting for somebody to go through every single one of those products and actually maybe they just they just want to be recommended a few as opposed to 50 or we we, we can start to we can start to put together uh, all these layers on top of our customer persona which then allow us to really focus on exactly what that person wants and 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 deliver that with our website uh right that's it sorry for taking up so so much of your time um and then yeah of course questions etc cetera, etc cetera. thanks no, very much thank you john honestly that was brilliant thank you so much no worries. Um, we'll take a quick look at the q a so we had some questions asked throughout both of your presentations so um i'll jump straight back in um Probably start with you, Aaron, first, give you a little bit of a break, John, because I'm going through. And um, I was gonna say actually as well, I didn't realise anyone would be using a hairbrush in 2020. I just thought hairbrushes were out the window. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, not me. Yeah. So yeah, um, this is a question for you, Aaron. Um, just recapping, are you able to quickly recap on the tools that you were using to get that cool web vital stuff? I know we're sharing the presentation, but we just had a question. Um, obviously on what they were. Yeah, um, I've got the links on actual deck, so I, can, I guess you could share that afterwards. Yeah, but, uh, if not, I can put them in the chat, I guess, or something. But I think um, essentially it was web page test, dot, I think it's org, I'm blanking now, let me just double check. Yeah, it's web page test dot org is the uh, main tool I kind of showed. Yeah. Um, Lighthouse is a Chrome plugin. Mm -hmm. I've used Google Lighthouse Chrome or Lighthouse plugin. Yeah. Then I'll give you the chance to install that. And then the other piece was um, the coverage report. So that's inside of, it's already on Chrome. So you kind of just go to more tools, uh, developer tools, and then it's inside of there. 
it's hard to yeah it's hard to, they're not like <laughs> immediately able available to you just kind of got to go through a couple of things but um i'll put it in the deck and you can share that around um and the chrome ux report if you just google it you'll better find it as well so the chrome ux there studio connector amazing they're all there um but yeah they're not just linked unfortunately i wish i'd just share them but um yeah, yeah. That's all good. Yeah. And we like Aaron said, we were, we're going to share around the presentation. So that will all be in there as well. Um, and then another question, Aaron, for you was with, um, so say, for example, the document release time is something you look at quite a lot. So say, for example, if you did find the developers rolled out an update that really pushed that time up, um, would you recommend or would you go in and be like, oh, can you please roll that back? Like, when would you make that decision to kind of you know, it might be something that you have to roll back. Yeah, I think we've had that before. I mean, we've had releases that we had to roll back, not just because of that, but just because it would break something. Yeah. Um, like the website, Tent Comics Lands, but that's just really bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, I mean, essentially, you can either, with that tool, obviously, what you can do is then say exactly what did change, and whether it's a myriad of things. So if it's like the five things have changed, and one of those five things has obviously made a, that impact and really caused that. Uh, time to load then we can ask can we either optimize it or kind of reduce it or kind of you know um, compact it or whatever it might be or if it's really kind of severe then can we roll it back and look at another another means I think one of the biggest things that uh, developers not overlook but when they're kind of just brief they're very you know they just do exactly what they're briefed <laughs> I think a lot of the time the delivery is, can be changed to kind of prevent a lot of things so whether you use like server side rendering or you know like Kind of preload things you can reduce a ton of stuff or utilizing like um you know third party um tools to kind of store things and stuff like that so there's, there's so many ways you can kind of do it so how long is a piece of string so i think essentially that's what you can utilize with the breakdown is then to say here's our options and here's what we can get to but before rolling back and then if we can't do that then we have to roll back essentially, essentially. yeah which the developers would love you for, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they don't mind it. It's normally, they, it's normally people that have a target to hit, you know, like our release to hit or whatever it might be. So I think mean, developers are normally really open to stuff. So. Oh, that's good. Um, and then this will be a question um, for both you, Aaron and John. Um, but obviously, we'll start with you, Aaron. So have you seen any impact from the December update? Um, and then obviously, how do you kind of manage any potential impacts from updates? How do you kind of keep an eye on that and stuff? Obviously, that was the Google um, algorithm update that was said to have happened in December. Yeah, I mean, I've not, we've not seen anything. And to be honest, I kind of, like I said, like, because we're kind of in a house now, I kind of focus on, on, on us, so we've not really seen anything. But I think obviously that could just be a matter of prevention or, or something like that. So I think um, really just, you just obviously just, there's loads of tools like Penguin and with Penguin, I don't know what's my head. You can check off these fluctuations and kind of map that to your performance. But, you know, if there is an impact, it's just a matter of kind of crawling through again and seeing what can be changed. Because, you know, in reality, we never know <laughs> what's happened. So we have to just go and figure it out. And BSEO is really far, so how? Perfect. Yeah, the magical box is Google. Um, and then, yeah, John, um, the same for you as well, really. Uh, we'll start with that question. It's more of a generic one, whether you kind of saw any impact or anything like that. Um, yeah. How monitor it? Um, we saw no again not 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 really some fluctuations um, some 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 kind of minor uplifts um, but but no I saw bigger fluctuations over some of our competitors. Um, uh, Google's recommendation is to is the, or, or is essentially that you you there is nothing that you can do that's not you know obviously entirely true but it's but it's helpful to appreciate that um, it's not necessarily a bad thing if you're seeing negative change negative changes to your performance not for not for the not for the end user anyway um uh if, if you have been hit the best thing to do is to is to wait for a little while give it a couple of weeks or or, or a month or so um sometimes those those changes uh slowly revert um and then again it's a it's a case of going back to user intent search intent and understanding uh, how your how and why your the pages that you've lost performance on no longer meet that intent. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And then we've had another question, um, obviously, John, for you. Um, so, how do the kind of statistics around bio research and the intent work that you were kind of um, showing relate or translate across to B two B businesses? 
are they transferable? Kind of how would you go around that and everything? So, uh, yeah, so I had some B2B examples in there. Rapid prototyping is, a, is, a, is technically a big, or, you know, if you were a, if you were a design managing patching company, you know, you'd be looking at rapid type of prototyping keywords um, as, a, as B2B. Um, and the same with, what was the other example? Marketing agency, that's a B2B search. Um, you know, you're, you're, you, in, in theory, you would be a business looking for a marketing agency. So it, it, does, it doesn't really change. In, in you, you, still, you still have customers who are making searches um, and, you're, and you're, you're using those processes to understand what it is that they're trying to achieve. If anything, it might be slightly easier. The intent might be less nuanced for B2B. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, so when you're obviously looking at search intent and everything like that, do you tend to look with your kind of SEO team or do you bring the whole marketing team in with that piece of work and everything like that? Yeah, so an, an SEO might be look, might look at it through a different lens, but it's, it's helpful to think of SEO as a proxy to real life or as a proxy to wider marketing. Search intent, in theory, is 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 just understanding the intent that somebody has um and that's the same intent if they you know if they walked into your shop or if they if they uh uh you know through 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 other channels or other different types of um marketing so it's 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 helpful it's mostly helpful for seos because we can affect you know and inform our seo strategy but there's insight way beyond seo into into just who your customers are and, and what they're trying to do do you find that, um, say, for example, with user personas, I don't know whether you use them at Wax, but that could maybe help inform user personas or anything like that? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think so. Yeah, I think that you, there's 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 so m many more layers that you can put on if you if you if you take a deeper, a, a, a deeper, more empathetic look at their problems and solutions and what they're trying to do. And, uh, and the, the information that you need to inform that can 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 come all come from looking at the results to their keywords. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, so that's all the questions. If anyone else has any more questions that they haven't had a chance to submit um, or want a follow up question, then just let us know and we can kind of pass them on to Aaron and John. I'd just like to say, obviously, thank you for the presentations today. Um, they were all brilliant. I loved them. Um, so and thank you to obviously everyone who attended. Like I said, any additional questions, feel free to pop us an email and we'll be kind of happy to answer them for you. So after the webinar as well, um, you'll be redirected to a quick feedback survey. So if you're able to take a couple of minutes just to complete this, um, it would obviously be massively appreciated. Um, you'll also receive an email kind of later today, tomorrow with our next event details um, and the presentation slides, like I said, for anyone who wants to kind of recap on them from our speakers. Um, for future events, if you've got any ideas um, of brands, marketing techniques or speakers that you kind of like to hear through the digital surgery, then please just let us know. Um, and lastly, then head over to LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter and give us a follow at the digital surgery to keep up to date with the kind of new webinars that are coming up and everything like that. And I, yeah, like I said, thank you to John and Aaron for some brilliant presentations today and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks very much. Thanks. Okay. Okay.